Welcome compadres. Today I'm going to show you how to walk through a faster fatigue analysis. So in what case would we want to look at faster fatigue? Vibrational loading. That's right. That's right. So vibrational loading is a cyclical load or a periodic load and that leads directly to fatigue always all the time. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. So you can see here we have a lot of input data for this analysis and it can be quite intimidating. But the fact is, I've already looked at a lot of things that are encompassed in this, this box right here. So faster fatigue includes things like joint slip, joint separation, the fruster method, SN curves, modified Goodman fatigue lines. It, it encompasses a lot of things I've already covered. So that's what makes this analysis very comprehensive is it, it's going to melt all those stuff together all those concepts and it's going to tie them into one so if you understand how to do this or how to set this up you're well on your way to being a rock star in structural engineering if you already aren't okay so let's go ahead and step into it so the input data we have is going to include a lot of variables really the new thing here is going to be our RMS axial force we have RMS shear forces too. So what is RMS? It's root mean square value and it's really when we enter the vibration world root mean square is a way to make sense of a bunch of chaotic signals, stresses, loads caused by random vibration. Okay that's really all it means and it's the one sigma value. So when we think of random vibration um, we often assume they are modeled by a Gaussian or normal distribution with one sigma encapsulating 68% of our loads, two sigma encapsulating like 95%, and three sigma encapsulating like 99.3%. So that's where that RMS terminology is used. And okay, so this axial force is something. So when we model fasteners, let's step back for a second. If, when we model fasteners in FEA, a lot of times we can pull the translational loads out of those fasteners. So that's what we're doing here. I'm going to pull the axial load and then the two shear loads and we're going to apply this to our fatigue analysis. I've also included the fractional load carried by the fastener. This is what we talked about when we were talking about the fruster method. So when our joint is pressed together we model it as a series of springs in parallel. Our joints stack up representing one spring and then our fastener representing another which includes our unthreaded and threaded portion in some cases. So that's all that is and that's numbers calculated based on the geometry of the joint. Then we have our worst case vibration multiplier. In this case I'm using three sigma. So now um, our faster slip is going to include these parameters. And then now we step into our faster fatigue realm. We got threads per inch as one. And then we have another multiplier. In this case, I'm using 2.1 sigma for fatigue. It all depends on, on the company you work for and the industry you're in. I'm going to use 2.1 in this case. And then I've also included a stress concentration factor. So we're going to take in stress concentrations into this analysis. And then I have all my SN curve inputs, which we've talked about previously. So the first step is to evaluate joint separation, because if the joint separates, the fastener is going to fail. And the reason is, is because in the aerospace industry, we usually preload our fasteners beyond the yield point. So we're already putting a lot of tension on these fasteners. If the joint were to separate, then the fastener is going to take all that axial load. It's close to ultimate, the ultimate strength of it, and it's going to fail. So this is, if you remember, this is how we did our joint separation. That's kind of how it, what, how it was set up, how it was modeled. And we use our three sigma value. So we take our external load and we multiply it by our three sigma value, okay, as to calculate a margin of safety, right there. So now joint slip is another thing we evaluate and we use our three sigma values here to calculate a resultant shear load and then 
basically if this number is greater is less than zero it's not going to kill our analysis but it is going to introduce another load that our fastener has to take on so this is our fastener slip if this thing slips then our fastener is going to take on this shear force and then here I calculate a fastener area and then now we're stepping into our fatigue analysis so our preload is going to be our mean stress so I calculate our preload stress and that preload stress is going to be felt by both the joint member and the fastener as shown here they both feel with the same force values so I'm just taking this the preload force and dividing it by the area of the fastener next we want to find out how much of the external load axial load is transferred to the fastener so I use my 2.1 Sigma value here because we're in the fatigue realm and I take the 2.1 Sigma value axial value to calculate a tensile stress and then I want to figure out how much of that stress is transferred to the fastener so I multiply it by our the fractional load acting on the fastener which we calculate from the frustrum method and then now I'm calculating the shear load felt by the fastener so we built a little logic in this so I calculate an equivalent shear load the 2.1 value so this is different than the 3 sigma we calculated up here this is our 2.1 value because we're evaluating fatigue and then I calculate a shear stress on the fastener so the logic built into this it's important to note if our margin of safety for joint slip is greater than zero then our fastener is not going to feel that shear load because it hasn't overcome the force of friction but if it is less than zero then we calculate our shear stress that we will have to include that in our fatigue analysis so next I include stress concentration factors I don't include them for shear or the preload just the tensile load acting on the fastener so I take that 791 value and I multiply it by our stress concentration factor of 2.2 and now I want to calculate an equivalent Balmese stress. So to make sense of these loads, I want to calculate an equivalent axial load based off the shear and axial load values. And we do that using Balmese stress. So I'm calculating max Balmese stress by taking our preload, which is our mean stress, and adding the axial load. <coughs> due to the external load acting on the fastener so that so that external load is going to just be cyclical in nature so it's going to go up and down up and down and so is our shear load it's going to be cyclical going up and down between high and low points so it's going to look like this curve right here or at least that's how we model it as a sine wave or, or cosine wave whatever it's a cyclical load so you're going to have a shear curve like that shear stress curve and an axial stress curve so I calculate the max axial stress the min just by subtracting that value and then our shear max in this case it's zero and that all depends on whether the joint slips or not and then I have our mean stress which is just our preload and then I calculate an equivalent Mesi stress using our cyclical axial load and cyclical shear stress loads. I calculate a max value, a min value, and a point at the mid value. Okay, and so I calculate three values. I look at, I want to determine the max and the min Mesi stress. So I basically take these values and I want to see it, find the max value and I want to find the min value and want to incorporate into this equation right here I do the same for the alternating stress and then these are the parameters that are used to derive the SN curve we've talked about this these are our knockdown factors and then I plot them on this curve over here okay this is our knee in our SN diagram and then now what I can do is I can determine our modified Goodman lines so in this case our Goodman line is given by this equation it's going to basically set our x-intercept to our ultimate strength of our fastener and then our y-intercept to the uh, <clears throat> to the knee alternating stress 
So you can see here, this is our modified, or this is our Goodman line in blue right here, and then this is our yield line. This makes us makes it our modified Goodman line when we include that yield line, and then here is my operating point. So I plot the operating point from our mean and alternating stress values onto that curve, and then basically, if this operating point falls below the blue line, we're going to have infinite life, and so. I wrote some VBA code to basically determine whether our fastener has infinite life or not. In this case, it does, and you can obviously see that. But if I change our value, what if I ex extend this yield line? What, what is this going to return? So let's just change our mean value by adjusting the torque. Let's just call it 38 inch pounds instead of 20. And you can see here. Our operating point is above our yield line, so our fastener is going to yield. Okay. <clears throat> yes, but it yields. Okay. Now we go through and we let's just say we increase our torque to 48 inch pounds. Okay. If I increase it to 48 inch pounds, it's above our modified Goodman line. So what does that tell me? This thing isn't going to have infinite life. So is it going to have infinite life under this condition? No, that's what it does. And so I'm just using these equations to the right to determine that, these two. One for the Goodman line, one for the yield line. There's some logic built into that. But that's how that works. I mean, that is a lot of information packed into one spreadsheet. But this is how you do a fastener fatigue analysis okay and we're gonna apply this in a real-world problem using abacus later on so I hope you enjoyed the video and I'll see you next time adios